So, uh, hello folks, how are you? Welcome to Positive Nights. Um, this is kind of a, quite an exciting one tonight. Um, I'm doing this a long time, I suppose I could say. It started as the Buddha Bag, and now I do Positive Life magazine. And now it's evolved into Positive Nights events, and I have never uh, had somebody say to me that they were enlightened. So it's uh, unique, and uh, I'm fascinated to hear it. And the guest that we have tonight has spent his whole life, I suppose, from even his early life, uh, seeking that and being completely, I, uh, from the impression I get, really, really uh, consumed and interested in that path in life. Um, he uh, does an initiation called Shakti Path, and he has also worked with Mother Amma for um, about 15 um, 15 years, so we're going to have a really interesting conversation about a number of topics. Um, I'm going to ask you all to welcome Jan Esman to the stage. Thank Jan, you. You're very welcome. So um, we'll we'll do a before we get started. We'll do our short meditation. Yes, you happy to join us in that? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to ask you all to um, just bring your awareness into your heart center. Just get a sense of your feet on the ground. And as I said, just drop your awareness from your head into your heart center. And I'm just going to ask you for a couple of moments just to let go of the day that you've had, let go of everything, actually and step into the language of feeling rather than thinking. Just be with whatever you're feeling. Just get a sense of your breath uh, coming in and out of your heart center. really get a sense of the stillness. And a sense of peace on the on your inside, on the inside world. And with our conversation tonight, I'll ask you as well to kind of you know let your mind run its own commentary. Don't pay much attention to it. Just feel whatever's right for you. and let go of the rest. So, bring your attention back to your body now. Get a sense of yourself in the room. Feel the group connecting in a nice way. Open your eyes. And look how beautiful we are up here on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a bit funny because I've just interviewed JP Sears at the weekend. I was telling Jan about that. And Jan is a bit of fan, a bit of a fan of his. He takes the piss out of everything. And uh, so <laughs> it was just hilarious. Uh, I asked him um, if if these people in the audience followed you, what benefits would you give them? And he said, I, I would sleep with most of them. <laughs> um, except the ugly ones, he said. <laughs> It was completely hilarious, but we're going to move on to a totally different subject tonight and welcome you, Jan, to the stage. Um, Thank you for having me. Really delighted to have you. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so I've been exploring a little bit through the Buddha and the gas pump interview. Yes. Um, I'm going to start right where, right at the nub of it. And I'm going to ask you, uh, what is enlightenment? How would you describe it? There are many levels of enlightenment, actually. 
But the one common denominator is that you no longer identify with anything that is not you. And ignorance can be defined as identifying yourself as that which is not you. You think you're your thoughts, or you believe or identify with them, and your emotions, and your body, and your job, and it's all nonsense. Would that be described as self-realization when you get to that point where you no longer listen to your thoughts? That's self-realization, and that's internal non-duality. Because you've realized the absolute, unmanifest, pure being within yourself, and realize that to be your true self, your very nature. And does it follow uh, the bliss that you've talked about? Do you live in a state of bliss? Or yes. You do? Yeah. Are you feeling bliss right now? Yeah. I'm not feeling too bad myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> can you, <laughs> this can turn into a comedy show sometimes. Can you describe, uh, can you put that into words, how you feel on a daily bliss? basis? Bliss says it all. <laughs> you talked about love and devotion. Um, We'll have to talk about the various levels of enlightenment yes, first in yes. order to explain bliss. Okay, okay. Because bliss can mean so many things. Okay. Domestic bliss, sexual bliss. But the bliss of having part of you merged with the divine is something completely different. Take me through the levels, so... Did we start give with? you enlightenment? Yeah, we start... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. Well, take me through. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually refusing enlightenment. I'm hilarious. <laughs> take. Oh, how is the sound actually? Is there? Okay. Is that better? Are you buzzing? Okay. Sounds like a thunderstorm. This okay here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Brandon, I have a notebook backstage. Would you grab that for me as well, just in, inside? Um, so where were we? The stages. You wanted enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there, there are many phases you go through on the spiritual journey, and the first is a radical reorientation away from identification with the non-you towards seeking the real self. And we could call that awakening. I know other people use the word awakening differently, but that's how I use it, because you awaken to the search for the true self, for enlightenment, and you die to believing that eternal happiness comes from amassing possessions or sex or whatever. So the next phase is transcendental consciousness when you begin having some experiences like we, we, we have a model with two lines, and this is the ego, this is the borderline between the relative and the absolute, and down here we have the self. When you begin to meditate and you have a few glimpses of this down here, you get transcendental consciousness. But you're not realized in any, any degree, it's just a deepening of your, let's say, intuitive sense of what the meaning of spirituality is because you've begun to get some direct experiences of the real here. Then, in self-realization, on this borderline here, there's a basic contraction, which I call the I-ness, and that has to go away. And when that collapses, your self-awareness merges back into the void of the self. And that comes in a flash. And then you're self-realized. But it's just void. There's no love, bliss, devotion, in it at all. It's just pure being, um, pure can consciousness. Me, can you give me an example of anyone who, who is self-realized at the moment? That's oh, yeah, I'm know. sure a lot of these non-duality teachers are. Okay. For sure. And you mentioned Eckhart. Do you think he may be self-realized? Oh, yeah, he's certainly self-realized. I've never met the man, so I can't say how far he is. But judging from the power of now, it's, it only talks about self-realization. Okay. So this is a pure state of just beingness. Okay. Pure being. I didn't say in the now, mm. but I, you know, this in the now business is all because everything is only in the now. Mm. Suffering is only in the now. Ignorance only exists in the now. Did you go through these stages in this life yourself? Certainly. Okay, and you got, it's okay, so where have you progressed to now? 
where I progressed to now, three or four levels above that. Okay. So we went from self-realized, we went to enlightenment. Talk about another one here, God consciousness. You have to understand that in order to go beyond self-realization, you have to activate the divine energy within you, which is called Kundalini. And that is because the absolute down here has a dual nature. It's both in itself resting pure being, but it's also dynamic creative potential, which we can call Shakti, and the pure being is Shiva. Shakti contracts into this point of Ines, or Bindu as it's called, and this manifests your entire structure as a person, as an individual. So Kundalini has within itself knowledge of your structure. And this is a long detour, but I'm going to answer your question. Has within it knowledge of your entire structure, so it knows how to deconstruct it if you awaken Kundalini in a special way. And that awakening is Shaktipat. Now, um, you've realized this down here, but you haven't realized the Shakti part of it. So when you progress into God consciousness, you begin to sense the Shakti part in and as everything around you. And you usually project your religious, spiritual concepts onto it. That's why it's called God consciousness. And to me, that is the Divine Mother. Um, it can be Jesus, Krishna, whatever. Whatever form it takes. Whatever appeals the most to you and is most natural for you. Okay. Was, was this a compulsion in you as a young man to seek this out? Or an did obsession. It come, did it come looking for you or did you go looking Both. for it? Both. Okay. Um, some of your early experiences were true meditation. Yeah. Do you, do you want to take me to a significant one of those? I started with transcendental meditation. And uh, my first meditation, I jumped out of the body and was in bliss. I was hanging somewhere out here. My first meditation ever. Did it frighten you or did it? No, no. I felt thrilled. Did you? The release. Realizing I was not the body, I was a spiritual being. Wow. Were you able to look back down on the body? Um, no. But my perception focus was not up here, it was out here. But so it, it was such an amazing thing, you know, I, I didn't really examine it in any way. Did you feel a massive sense of expansion? Did you feel this awareness, this kind of... No, it was just a very joyful, I would say mild bliss. And my heart, you know, the eyelids were flickering. So there was an ecstasy to it. And, and obviously there were a signpost on your path. Um, I mean, I don't want to jump too far, but take me uh, to how you came to be with Ama. How did you, how did that come about? How I came to be with Ama? Well, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I've been seeking. I got self-realized in 1985, but I've, I've always known there was much more to it than that. So I've always been eager to, to you know, meet other beings that had progressed further than me and hopefully they could help me. Mm. So I visited various gurus and got Shatipat from this and that guru and had a, a guru in the early 80s actually called Guru Ajananda Yogi, strange guy. Yeah. You've heard of him? Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very odd man. Really? And um, then, then a friend of mine said, oh, there's this chubby lady who gives hugs and you should come and meet her. <laughs> well, I thought, okay, why not get a hug from a chubby Indian lady? <laughs> I got a few hugs from her too. They're pretty good. Yeah. So I, I went to Stockholm. This is many years ago. We were only 200 people at the, uh, at the event. So we had time to talk to Arma through a translator. And uh, I, I had one, you know, hug, and I realized he was one with the divine, with the divine mother, the absolute. So I asked her, "Hey, um, can you give me full enlightenment?" And you were self-realized at this time. I was self-realized yeah. at the time, but I said, "Can you take me to full enlightenment?" And she looked at me, smiled, and said, "Yes, yes." And she pressed me here and hugged me, and kissed my cheek, and then she started saying, "Ma, ma, 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 ma," in my ear. And suddenly she manifested inside my brain. And then she stopped saying ma, 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 and I thought, what the fuck is going on? 
And then she went away from inside my brain. And I, ah, damn, I lost this chance. I messed it up. And then she began saying, ma, ma, ma again, manifested inside me. And I surrendered to it completely. And she accepted me and we partially merged inside my brain. And she's been with me ever since. Did you travel with her as well? No. no. I only went once or twice a year to get these few hugs you can get. Yeah. And every year I would write on a piece of paper, please take me to full enlightenment. And she would say, yes. <laughs> and after I had asked her for 10 years, she would say, yes. You again. Yes. <laughs> you, you described her as uh, one with the Divine Mother. What was the word you used for that? Um, for the state she's in? Yes. Shiva consciousness. Shiva consciousness. Wow. Yeah. Because when you see her, I mean, people here have seen her. She never goes to the toilet. It's like she must do, I think I've seen her on stage for like 10 hours or go. And she's incredible. So she's a very high, one of the most, is she, would she be at the highest level of consciousness right now? I most Someone. certainly would say so, yes. Wow. Wow. Um, huh? Yeah, she's on next week. <laughs> We're going up the levels. So uh, let's talk about Shaktipat and Kundalini energy. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that and how it works and what it is? Well, I just described what, what um, the purpose of Shaktipat is, the, the special awakening of Kundalini. So it begins to reconstruct your nervous system so you can uphold states of enlightenment. And the, the beauty of it is that it's a spontaneous and automatic path of pure grace. All other paths, you know, if we have my two-line model, you start up here with, with the who you think you are, of course, the ego, the identification, and you do some practice. And you go here, and you go here, and here, and here, and around in circles. And sometimes you plop down and are lucky and get a glimpse of the real thing. But what happens with Shaktipat is that the Shakti down here becomes awakened or activated so that the absolute self begins to meditate on you as an ignorant individual, transforming you to uphold the state of enlightenment. <coughs> that is pure grace. And that's why the Siddha Yoga path, which is the path of Shaktipat, is normally associated with the Divine Mother because she represents this grace, rather her children like Anna does. You talked about the fact that you, you give Shaktipat to people. Yes. Uh, you meet them where they're at. Is that how it works? You said that yes. if, if you, if if somebody's not ready for shakti paths, it would have no effect. That's true. Yeah. What type of effects have you seen on people? With well, first I want to say that I give the same to everybody, which is a blast of shakti, and there's also a merging with the other person on the level of non-duality, both externally and internally. Now, what happens is some feel peace. But some people go into Nirvikalpa Samadhi and, and experience extreme bliss. And they laugh and cry or they just sit and blissed out for a couple of hours. That happens. Usually happens to some on the intensives. Some of the sensitive. On the intensives. The yeah. intensives is the three day event, three day event. where I give Shakti Pad. But I also give what is called Shiva Pad, which is, is an awakening of the enlightened state in the recipient. It plants at least a seed of the enlightened state, but in some they get a full experience of what it's like to be enlightened. I'm going to um, rewind slightly and ask you how you became self-realized. How did that actually happen? Um, now we have to talk about Krishna. Oh, if you don't want it, it's cool. Um, no, no, we can do that. We can do that. Um, I, I had a special experience when I was 19. I was doing transcendental meditation at the time. And th this, this, is, this is the reason I am where I am today, what the, the experience I'm going to describe. I was doing transcendental meditation, and I got bored with my mantra. Um, Ayn was the mantra, very boring mantra. So I was sitting doing that, and then, then I felt this enormous love for God, and I, for some reason, thought of Krishna. My parents are atheists, Westerners, an engineer, no Hindu spiritual background in my family, but I felt this longing for Krishna. So I sat there meditating on the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, or just meditating on Krishna's name, 
And then suddenly this this stylized eye appeared before my inner vision, and the the uh, the center was not black; it was cyan, shimmering, laser-like blue. And it came closer and closer and closer, and I looked at it, and I got more and more blissful. And then suddenly this blue pearl swallowed me up, and I <coughs> <coughs> sorry. I merged into an infinite void of pure blue consciousness. Extremely blissful, way, way beyond ecstasy. And in, I sat in that state and I realized that, you know, I could, I could stay in that state and be, you know, highly enlightened. And then the thought came to me, go, where's God? I longed for God with all my heart and I've done that all my life. So I began praying to Krishna again. And then out of this blue void, Krishna manifests, you know, blue being, it wasn't, you know, with many arms, he was just standing like that. And I surrendered to him and he accepted me and we merged and I wasn't conscious for like a second or so and then the meditation was over. But I had such a dramatic reaction, I had spasms, jerking, twisting for many hours afterwards. And when it settled down, I was in bliss for half a year and I saw God in everything. And then it gradually faded out and I became depressed. <laughs> What's it like to see God in everything? It's, uh, it's beyond description. It's really? wonderful, yeah. Do you see God in everything right now? Yeah, yeah. Even in you. Even in you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jan. <young. laughs> <laughs> you know, that's quite an experience. Wow. So that's, as you said, that made you instantly self-realize, you felt. There was planted a seed, which is still flowering, and we're flowering and keep on flowering in the future. And in that flash, I learned all the secrets of giving Shaktipat and Shivapat and various stages of enlightenment and so on. But it had to mature in me. Um, ten years later, I began giving Shaktipat, but I was only like 29 at the time, 28. And uh, people didn't take it seriously. You know, this young kid from Copenhagen giving Shaktipat, and it's such a you know, fantastic thing. So I stopped and I, I went into hiding for like 25, 28 years and only began teaching again a couple of years ago. So now you're coming out of your shell again? I have. And do you feel you're on a mission at the moment or no. do you just go no, where no you're No mission, called? no mission. I'm just going just, where mother wants me to go. Yeah. Um, I, I never wanted to be a teacher. I have no interest in being a teacher. But teaching happens around this one, so let it happen. Um, obviously, there's something going on in the planet right now. Yeah. There's a lot of people seeking. Um, uh, just one minute. Yeah. I never answered your question how I got self realized. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that happened with Guru Rajananda Yogi. I don't think he was instrumental in it. But I was, this was, in, as I said, in 85. I was on a, a one week retreat with him, and I, I was doing seva, which means service. I was setting the table for him and his uh, meditation teachers, their dinner table. And um, the Shakti, I just, you know, placed the, the plates and that was it. And the Shakti was so strong and I got so overwhelmed, so I sat down on a chair in the corner and blacked out. And when I opened my eyes again, somebody else had done the table, I hadn't heard a thing. And I was in insane bliss and I was crying hysterically and shaking. and. So I staggered to his room and knocked on his door and, and came in. And uh, I didn't know what had happened. How could I know? And so I just wanted to be with him and hopefully he would tell me. But his, his way of teaching was find out for yourself. So he would certainly not tell me anything. And he, uh, he asked me what my name was and I had no idea because I was totally out of there. There was just pure being. And I looked at him strange and said, I don't remember, I, I have no idea. Hmm, he said. Then he asked me, how old are you? And that was an even more ridiculous question because, you know, being has no age, there's no time there. So I thought, okay, I'll try to count years back to when I was born and then I could give him, you know, a somewhat approximate answer and make him happy. 
But I didn't stop in my birth. I went life, 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 life. And when I was like 3,000 years back, I thought, okay, this is not what he's asking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, a, you've got an insight into all your past lives? Yeah, the last at least two, two and a half thousand years. And have you always had kind of very spiritual type lives? Yes. Yes, okay. Well, not always. There have been a few mistakes. But I've been a seeker for a long time. Uh, what is it that we're seeking right now? I mean, you can feel there's something going on, as I, as I mentioned. What is it that we're seeking? What are we seeking? What are we, as a general thing? Kind of people. What are we people? Having? Spiritual people? Mm. Most spiritual people just want to feel good and be happy. I call that feel-good spirituality, and it's never going to take anyone to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Not one bit closer. Because it's in the ego, personality, relative structures, more or less subtle. But um, working with that will never give enlightenment. You have to understand, enlightenment is not something you grow or develop. You are already perfect. The self is perfect already. Enlightenment is rediscovering your self as it is perfect already so the whole notion that you have to grow into enlightenment and can become like 50 percent enlightened or 60 percent enlightened is utter nonsense either you're enlightened or you're not period and how do you like how do you how do you what would you advise people how, if somebody come up to you and said hey i want to be enlightened what come to say? my come to my shots of come the show. <laughs> <laughs> It's great marketing. <laughs> um, or go to somebody else and get shots of pet. But get shots of pet. Now, not many who give shots of pet. There's probably only like five or ten in the West who can give the real thing. I like when you said we're all perfect, or the self is perfect. Um, it is. The beingness is perfect. We're already enlightened. <laughs> In yes, a sense. yes, we're already enlightened. We just have to remember it. We don't know it, so we have to discover it or remember it, whatever way you want to phrase it. Do you feel there's something specially significant going on now that we in are shifting world? in some way in the world? The world is going to enter an enlightened period. I'm quite sure about that. But we haven't seen the worst of the crisis yet because there's a battle between light and darkness. So I, th I think things are going to tense up or are going to get polarized more. But we'll see more evil and we'll also see more spiritual people getting enlightened or awakening at least. Do you get a sense when this period is about to begin or? No, oh, it's already, no, when the enlightened yeah. age, yeah. Well, no, I have, I have no idea. Mm. But I, probably within a couple of generations. Will you put my name down for it when you're speaking to the <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I want to talk to you a bit about karma. <coughs> karma? Yeah. What's your understanding of karma? Well, we have three kinds of karma. At least that's what the Indian tradition teaches us. We have what's called Sanchita karma, which is the huge pile of karma from our many, many lives that we've accumulated. And out of this huge amount of karma, which all has to burn for you to get fully enlightened, by the way, um, we, we take a chunk, and that's called prarapa karma, and that chunk is what we have to live out in this incarnation. And no matter how enlightened you get, prarapa karma is set in motion, and you will have to experience it and go through it. But the beauty is, it's like a bunch of arrows are shot at various targets at your birth, and if you follow a straight line, they'll hit you. But with spiritual practice, you can, you know, go a bit off course, so instead of hitting you in the heart and killing you, they hit you in the foot or something like that. And the other one? The third karma? Well, that's a karma you create now that has a, a effect on your future lives. But when you get self-realized, you don't generate that anymore. Because you're a witness. You've gone beyond the, the energies of karma into the unmanifest. It still plays out, but you're able to kind of navigate it. The Parappa karma plays out. Mm. That's why you have enlightened beings who 
uh, ardent smokers or drinkers or get this and that odd disease which you wouldn't expect. Or some have strange characters and are angry like Guruji Krishnamurti and Guru Rajananda. He was a heavy drinker and Nisikadatta was a heavy smoker. You know, it's that for Rabda karma. Someone asked Nisikadatta why he smoked. And he said, I smoke because I don't want to come back again just to smoke. <laughs> I want to get it over with. You wanted to get it over with, yeah. Get rid of that karma. You know, sometimes I get this feeling that when you're at one with everything, you're having the best, you're just having such a fulfilled experience that we decide to come here and, and actually take on this human mind that comes to kind of torment us in a way that's part of the game. Can you talk about the human mind? How se like in your daily life, how seriously do you take the mind now? I don't take it serious at all. No attention from you at all? No, not very much. You know, it's a useful tool in, in doing things. I write books. I also program software. and, and do, I'm an artist in general uh, and, and the author. Um, and you need the mind to perform those tasks. But it's not you anymore. You're a witness to it. So there's complete silence. And yet there is thinking, but the thinking is not verbalized. It's on a conceptual level where it moves much faster. So you don't think in a linear sentence structure with arguments and logic. You just jump concepts back and forth in just, you know, in a, in a subtle level where it's not verbalized. And then when you reach something interesting, you might verbalize it or you just write it without even verbalizing it. That's how it works. It, uh, if you were to describe it as like, before you became self-realized, your mind was operating at a certain speed and now it's kind of reduced to a very significant, almost non -existent. My mind is very fast. Yeah, when you need it. Yeah, when I need it. Okay. Otherwise there's mostly silence and bliss. Such a nice way to live, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let's talk about the nature of the self. The nature of the self? Well, as I said, it has this dual quality. It's pure being, ever in itself resting. The mythological figure Shiva is depicted as eternally in the deepest samadhi. And that just refers to the self as being self-absorbed. But there's another part of it which wants to express itself, the Shakti dynamic principle. And you have to realize both those aspects to get full enlightenment. And there's also Satchitananda, which means beingness, consciousness, and bliss. So if somebody says he's enlightened and he's not in a state of bliss and intense devotion to God, he's not really enlightened, not very highly, for sure. When you get highly enlightened, you live in a state of devotion to the divine in and as everything all the time. And everything radiates devotion to you all the time. The, div the divine in everything is devoted to you as an enlightened being. And you feel such love and devotion for the divine in everything, so it's a constant flux or exchange. It's, it's, there's no word for it. And sometimes it's very high and then you can't function. And if you need to function, you lower it down on a lesser level. And it's just like every cell in your body is vibrating with bliss. When you've lowered it down? Or yes, when, just when you lower it down. Yeah I've, heard, yeah, I've heard of people not being able to function. Yeah. In some of the research I did for the magazine, um, we came across one woman who went to India and she just couldn't do anything for weeks on end. So she must have had some kind of big experience. Um, yeah people had to look after her. Have you had that experience in your life where you became, you seem to be able to navigate, you seem to be able to integrate it quite quickly. Yes, it's been like that for me. Mm. But as I said, I, you know, I have this relationship with the Divine Mother and she's been following me and she guided me to Amma. So I feel protected, mm. yes, you know. Mm. Because these experiences, can they be scary for people if they're not ready for them? Or well, Kundalini mm. often, the word Kundalini often scares people. Mm. So we, we should talk a bit about that. 
because you hear these scary stories of all this energy rising in the spine and jumping around in the body and causing spasms or pains. Or, and if you don't know what's going on, it'll, it'll cause anxiety, of course. But if you know what's going on, there's nothing to be afraid of. And there's two, three, three ways Kundalini operates. One is the normal sleeping, dormant Kundalini, which is not sleeping, it's upholding everything. Your thinking is a manifestation out of Kundalini. It's the primal energy in man from which all the other energies emanate or come from or spring. Now, then you have the Kundalini arousal where an unwanted huge amount of energy is discharged into the system. And that is what is often misnamed the Kundalini awakening. And that can be quite unpleasant. It's usually very blissful also, but then people get scared and then it's very unpleasant. And the worst thing you can do in that situation is to fight the energy. You have to let it work itself out. But when I've had many of these cases come to me, well not many, there's several, one. Mm. and uh, I find that they, in general, those that have problems, they fight the energy, they just want it to go away. So I meditate with them, give them Shaktipat, try to explain to them that it's actually an opportunity and they should work with it. And the Shaktipat usually helps because it brings Kundalini into the third way of operating, which is the awakened way, where it begins to reconstruct your nervous system so you can uphold the state of enlightenment. And it, does not, it may, might push you to the limit, depending on how much you want and how serious you are and so on. But I have never seen it cross the line with Shatipat, with a proper awakening, never. I feel if something is visiting upon you in that sense, you're able for it. I mean, you've, you've called it in some way. Yes. But you, there's a word that you've used, and I've heard you use it, and it's surrender, and it's a beautiful word. And it's, it's once you surrender and merge, resistance is really futile, and resistance causes a lot of the problems, as you say. Um, talk about surrendering a bit. Surrendering is very important. Yeah. The three main things on this path is love, devotion, and surrender. And you can't really have true intense devotion if you don't have love for the divine. You can practice acts of devotion, but that's not real devotion. That's just, you know, singing a song, kirtan or whatever you want to call it. And um, the real devotion is an outpouring of enormous intensity. And that requires a lot of love. And if you don't have devotion, it's difficult to surrender because you need an object of devotion to which you can surrender. How, I mean, how do you... Now, just you a minute. Say, yeah. Surrender is extremely important in the meditation we do because the Shakti, we do meditation techniques. You know, I have a handful of, of Kriyas, as they're called. And uh, they invite the Shakti to be active in the system. But when it becomes active and you feel the bliss of the Shakti, you surrender to it. And that should go for any meditation technique. Because I say meditation is like taking a train. The technique is the train and you want to go to a certain station. When you reach the station, you have to get off the train. Otherwise, you'll end somewhere else. Similarly, the technique can take you close to the self, but not to the self. So you have to get off the technique. No technique will ever make anybody enlightened. It can you know, help you in the right direction, but eventually you have to let go and surrender into the absolute. You offer a number of meditation practices. Yeah, I do. Meditation is a direct route, you feel, to this. No, I just explained it's an indirect route. An indirect route. No, it, it takes you close to it. It invites the Shakti. And then the Shakti takes you there. This is a path of grace. I love the word grace. Yeah. Beautiful word. Um, I want to talk a bit about emotions. Human emotions. Yeah. How to navigate them. Yeah. Is it again about surrendering to them? I mostly feel love and devotion. 
I can get annoyed and irritated, you know. I have my Parappa karma, and if something happens, you know, if somebody's an asshole in a shop, I, you know, the mind thinks, what an asshole. But the interesting thing is, once it's over, it's gone. Because you're not attached to it. You're a witness to that whole game. You're not part of it anymore. And because you're a witness to it, not involved with it, it doesn't linger on. So talk, tell me about your life now. What's your daily routine? What do you do? Do you meditate a lot? Do you, no. do you practice a lot? What do you do? No, I used to meditate a lot, like six hours in one sitting every day, doing Kundalini work. But now, no, no, it's a spontaneous process going on all the time. I do meditate like 20 minutes every day because I like it. Mm. But not more than that. Sometimes I do it twice a day. That's not much. I generally recommend like 45, 50 minutes twice a day mm -hmm. if you want to be serious about it. But people should do what they're okay with. But on this path, it's important to get a sense of the Shakti every day, so the Shakti keeps working in you. And I don't have to do anything for that anymore, because it's such an integrated part of my being. Can you talk to me a bit about the difference between Shakti and Shiva energy? It's not really energy. And there's no, really no difference between Shiva and Shakti. We just use those two words in order to explain to um, qualities, so to speak. But there are, aren't qualities in the absolute either, so words fail. But she, Shakti is never separate from Shiva. It just appears to be because it exists in what I call a contracted form. And it, when when the Kundalini process, I mean, when my Kundalini snake really awoke after these many months of six hours meditation, it was like a snake this long, silver in color, the thickness of a pencil. It entered the spine and crawled up, and then it dissolved into light and merged back into Shiva. It's a very physical, extremely physical experience. You really feel like something is crawling physically inside your spine, and it is outrageously blissful. It's like having sex with God or something like that. <laughs> uh, sex with God. <laughs> How are we doing for time there, Brendan? Half eight now, okay. So we're going to take a break in a while. Um, I want to ask you about what you're going to be teaching here over the next few days um, and how it works and how it transpires. Do you do a satsang or do you kind of... Take me through it a little bit. We talk a little bit, you know, but the, the most important thing is the transmission, the Shakti field. When, when I do these retreats, I discard a number of layers of ego and personality so there's a much stronger flow of Shakti. And the main thing is to get Shakti going, flowing, active, awakened in the, in the participants. But nothing is going to happen that is not ready to happen. So nothing is forced onto people. I'm just making the Shakti available and sharing it equally with everybody. And we do that in meditation. So I have a chair here and here. People come up and I put my hand on their knees, thighs. And we meditate for like 15, 25 minutes. And the, the Shakti feel becomes extremely intense. And some pick it up, some don't. I can't give any guarantees, but there are usually some who merge into extreme bliss during the intensives. They really pick it up. And in general, everybody feels peace and calm, at least. And when they get home, then maybe it begins. Because the, the awakening happens, the Shakti pack happens, but they're not ready for the arousal and the activity of the Shakti. So that does not happen. But if they meditate and practice, then it will eventually happen sometime in the future. So a large part of what goes on is meditation. I usually have three sessions, two or three sessions with people next to me. That takes an hour or an hour and a half. Then we have a break. 
And then this question answers, if anybody has a question, I'll do my best to answer it, but you know, lectures. I talked like we, we did now, a bit about karma and the self, and I've basically given a uh, all-round presentation here of what I talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, as I said, love, devotion, and surrender are the important thing. All the rest is mind stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not important, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. We hear a lot of talk about the human heart and the kind of language of feeling and getting out of the head, like the little short meditation I did. Yeah. How important is, is the heart and all? Do you feel the heart center in, in sure. where it's based? It's yeah. always on fire. Yeah. Yours is? Yeah. There's always a warm bowl in the middle of my chest. Mm. So it's very important, very important. But there's one, one level, one kind of love below the heart, which is more like a, a contract between two people of mutual gratification. And then with the heart, you begin to have an unselfish element in the love. And then there are different qualities of love when you move up. You begin to, you know, feel the love of the divine and devotion and so on. They're, they're difficult to put into words. It won't mean anything, but there, there are different variations of love. It, it, it doesn't stop with the heart. And, and just because it's the crown chakra does not mean it is intellectual. Not at all. It's, it's super blissful love, devotion. You, you talked about in your early life, when I listened to the, the other interview that you did about yearning for God all my life do you, you no longer yearn oh well, very much so you still yearn for yeah. God yeah okay and because you know th these are the further aspects of enlightenment maybe we should talk about that we start by God consciousness yeah yeah after God consciousness you enter what we call unity consciousness in unity consciousness the realization of Shakti in and as everything and in and as you is so strong that you experience it as a non-dual state of um, the absolute, which in this case is enlightened, enlightened, so I call it Shakti. And this, this is unity because there's a duality in God consciousness where you have the divine and you have you and there's a relationship between you. There's non-duality within, but there's still a duality out here. And this is, this is my critique of all these non-duality teachers. They've reached non-duality within, but there's still a duality between their inner life and their outer life. That's my impression anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it's just self-realization. Not all of them, but many of them. Mm -hmm. um, Unity consciousness and God consciousness are not something that comes like self-realization. It's more like phases that flow in and out e each other and there's a deepening going on all the time. And then there is a um, something that comes like that and that's when unity consciousness becomes absolutely stable and we call that Sahaja Samadhi which means a natural spontaneous state of Samadhi. Samadhi is oneness with the absolute. So Samadhi is something you would, uh, you would reach well, I suppose gurus would reach in a kind of meditative state, but you you, de you describe Mother Amma. Oh, no, Mother Amma would be Shiva consciousness. She's in Shiva consciousness. Which is the next level up. Yeah, a couple of next levels. A couple of next levels. At least. But because, you know, I, I was, when I met Krishna or, or Shiva, or whatever we want to call the blue being, I was in a state of Shiva consciousness, but only for a fraction of a second. I couldn't take more than that. Mm. So I know it's there, I know what it's about. And you merge with the divine, the ultimate being, like Amma has merged with the divine mama. It's such an extremely high state, there's not much point in talking about it, really. How is it important for, is it very important for people to connect with a guru, do you feel, in some way? You need a teacher on the path, yes. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to make it on your own. Unless you have these uh, connections with the divine, like I had, I've been on my own all my life. I've never had a guru. Guru Ajananda Yogi was not really a guru. He what was, kind of a character was he? A bit of a, uh, you said he was quite an unusual man. He was a very unusual man. Well, he, he, drank, he liked to drink. 
I, I remember one afternoon he was so drunk we had to carry him up to bed. Uh, but he, he, he deteriorated the last years of his life. He died at 62, which is quite young. And, um, but at other times he would be, you know, radiant and totally clear, crystal clear, give wonderful lectures. What level was he operating at? I had no idea. But there's one funny story about him because he, he did not like New Age spirituality. He thought it was a, a load of bullshit. And uh, there was this uh, uh, conference, like a body, mind, spirit conference, where a lot of New Age teachers and spiritual teachers would, would show up and give lectures. And the Danish uh, girl who arranged it had uh, arranged him for, for him to give a lecture. He didn't want to, but she forced him to do it. So he went there, and uh, the hall was packed, and they had paid paid for it. And he started by saying, you won't understand a word of what I'm going to say anyway, so I might as well speak Chinese. And then he sat like that until everybody had left and got their money back. <laughs> we could try that in the second half. <laughs> Um, I think it's on that note we'll, we'll take a little break we're going to take a 10 minute break and there's some juices outside for you in the second half let's turn this into a, a conversation with you guys um, so have a think about some questions that you might have for Jan um, but in the meantime let's just give him a big round of applause for the first time <laughs>